Lisa here. Welcome back to my channel. Welcome to my weekly deck reviews. In this weekly video, I like to share with you the decks I've been working with for this past week and how they've been working out. And then also share with you what I'm going to be working with next week. And if I seem a little hyper, it's because this is going to be a bit of a speed filming. I'm currently in the middle of watching The Phantom of the Opera because at the time I'm filming this, Andrew Lloyd Webber's YouTube channel is running the 25th anniversary version of the stage production for free on YouTube and raising money for um, artists and it's really cool and I'm in it about an hour. You can only watch it for 48 hours so if you're seeing this video later I'm very sorry but I need to get back to it. <laughs> I also don't want to miss my weekly deck review so I'm taking a little break filming this and then I'm gonna go back out there and see what happens because I've actually never seen The Phantom of the Opera. There's a movie version. Sorry, I'm sidetracking. There's a movie version, <laughs> but I haven't seen it because I was told myself I wanted to see the stage production first. So now that I'm seeing the stage production, I can also watch the movie at some point. But anyway, let's talk about what I have been working with over the past week. So I've actually been working with the Falarcos Tarot by Carmen Sorrenti and the Illuminated Earth Oracle by, I was just gonna say her name wrong, Claire Mack, this one. So let's talk about the tarot in the order that I normally do things anyway. So this deck, which is still in print, I think it came out in 2019, if I remember correctly, and it is available on arnellart.com. Um, is that the website, Arnell Art? Yeah, arnellart.com. There it is on the bottom of the box. And I trimmed my copy, so it was bordered. It had borders all the way around, like a thinner border, and I believe it was like a cream color. Maybe it was black on the front, cream color on the back, yeah. Black border on the front, and it was like a cream color border. This is what the backings look like. And I edged my deck in this like sort of rose, rosy red color. It looks a little redder in my viewfinder right now to me, but it's a little more pinky red than true red. Kind of like a magenta, I guess. Mm, I don't know. Anyway, I like it. And I think it plays really nicely off the heart that's on the back of the cards. And I also think there's a lot of that sort of like rosy, oh, maybe not there. There's a lot of the sketchy cards that have that sort of rosy red color through them. Yeah, like this card, you can see that rosy red in the detailing. And here, sort of in the background. So it's not everywhere, but it's just enough that, yeah, here's a good one. Lots of it. So... I had a really cool experience with this deck this week. So first of all, this is a very dreamy deck, which makes perfect sense because the word Falarcos, I believe, is a reference to um, either a myth or a historical thing. Clearly, I'm very knowledgeable about this. Um, <laughs> said with sarcasm. Um, there's some kind of a myth or something that where Falarcos were people who would dream for you. They would go into caves and they would dream for you. And I... I found that out by, um, I believe it's in the introduction of the guidebook if I remember correctly, but it's also, I watched two different interviews with Carmen Sorrenti so that I could get to know the deck a little bit better. Um, and I will say that this has a very dreamy, sort of intangible quality to it, which is really interesting. This would not be a deck that I think I would be particularly quick to read for, read with clients, um, read for clients with, yes, there we go. Uh, however, it was really interesting to dive into throughout the week. I felt like it sort of like, it's hard to describe. It was almost like every time I would pull a card, it'd be like a little thread that I'd have to tug on. And as I tugged on the thread, the meaning would sort of slowly unravel. I don't know if that makes any sense, but it kind of felt like that. It kind of felt like I had to nudge and pull it out a little bit, um, which was really interesting. However, I had a really specifically unique experience with this deck. So one day this week, I think it was Wednesday, I had drawn, for some reason I had felt called to draw two cards um, for that day. I can't remember if I was working with positions, I don't think I was. And that day I had also ran out of little of the photo paper in my little um, printer where I usually print my spreads and then journal them. But the two cards I had gotten was the moon and the trail of spirals, which is the knight of pentacles. And both cards, when I read the guidebook, I'm trying to look for them now. Of course, I can't find them now that I want them. Um, both cards spoke about, in the guidebook, spoke about ferrying and like transitioning from one world to another and this sort of idea of being ferried. So I kind of made note of the reading. I sat with it for a bit and then I shuffled the cards and I put them away. And the next day when I went to pull my daily draws, I shuffled and shuffled and shuffled and shuffled as I usually do because I usually just kind of like let myself kind of my mind kind of wander as I'm shuffling. 
why can't I find these cards? And as I'm doing that, as I'm shuffling in that way, I'm mixing the cards pretty dang thoroughly. Like, I feel like it's kind of hard. I'm not even gonna be able to find the cards. And it doesn't even really matter to the story. But as I'm shuffling, and shuffling and shuffling and shuffling, I'm like letting my mind wander. And then I do my normal trick, which is I do some hand over hand. Um, I do one last rifle shuffle and then I cut, which is typically my shuffling technique. I cut the deck and when I cut the deck, sometimes I just quickly cut it. But sometimes if I'm really being present, I will sort of slowly fan the cards out until I feel the right spot to cut it. It's kind of like the old trick where you would hover your hand over your, the back of your cards to feel where you need to pull from. And so I did that. And I pulled the top card, um, it wasn't this, but I pulled the top card and it was the moon again. And I was like, that's weird, that's what I pulled yesterday. So I pulled a second card and it was the trail of, of spirals again, the knight of pentacles. And I was like, that, I don't think that's ever happened. It's one thing for me to draw a single card a couple days in a row, that's happened to me before. But drawing a two card combo and drawing the exact same two card combo the next day when I know I have shuffled like crazy was really different. And I ended up actually, once I pulled those two cards, I'm like, okay, this is obviously a big message. So I pulled a third card and then I looked at the cohesive message of those three cards and it, it was very personal, but it ended up being incredibly powerful. And then I had also pulled an Oracle card from the Illuminated Earth deck. And interestingly, all three cards spoke about movement and ferrying. They talked about moving from one phase of life to another phase of life. And when you, when I say that the messages were cohesive, I think it's really important to point out that the messages in this guidebook are very intangible. They're very dreamy. They're very nonspecific. They're very kind of like if somebody was describing a dream to you, that's how these little passages read. So they're not always the like straightforward easy to follow messages where you can see how things line up and so it was really interesting and strange to me that both of the well all three of the cards that I pulled had messages about releasing and moving forward and transition and all this kind of stuff and then ironically the Pathfinder Oracle card that I pulled also literally used the word um what was it fairy man or something it was like a, a similar word that was in these other cards it was a really trippy, synchronistic reading. I journaled a bunch about it. Um, in fact, I even took out my, I, I use my handwritten journal for basic notes and reading, but I actually took out my digital journal and I like typed out a whole entry. I, I copied over what the guidebook had to say about each of the cards so that I can go back to that reading in detail and revisit it. I do think given the current global climate that the reading was meaningful given the current situation we're in and sort of how that's impacting me personally what things are shifting and changing and sort of how I'm navigating this whole situation. It ended up being a very meaningful experience. So I really enjoyed that. But that being said, I mean, this artwork is not any way, shape or form a Rider Waite Smith clone. There are hints of it. If you look, um, there are definitely some really interesting takes on the cards in here. And there's definitely room for your intuition to play, particularly in the minor arcana. I feel like because they are sketched in, the, in a way where they're kind of like little ideas and sketches kind of put together into one image, um, some of the minor arcana feel a lot more fleeting and ethereal than others do. But there's a lot there. Like this is probably one of the most cohesive minor arcana images and this is the Nine of Spirals. This feels like an illustrated minor, whereas a lot of the others feel, let's see if I can find some here. I'm going to hold this up so it doesn't do the focus thing because I know that makes people like kind of dizzy. Keep it focused on the card for a second. But a lot of them are more like this. So the painted really like this. Yeah, like this one. Where you kind of get, you have some words, you have some things happening. Um, they just feel less tangible. I don't know how else to describe it. So this deck in a way kind of messed with my head a little bit. It just was a little bit floaty and high vibe and ungrounded for me particularly for what I'm looking for right now in my tarot practice which was kind of challenging in a way um but really interesting and I think definitely a deck that I will be revisiting I think this could be a really really potent and powerful deck to use in past life readings I don't know it well enough to really know if I want to stretch it in that way but I think it could be really good because it's it is so intangible um and then sometimes some of the words are really interesting like this is the eight of spirals apprenticing infinity in the here and now the love that I feel for you is always love for you and just like interesting like little bits right like that I think could jump out at you intuitively if you were interested in getting getting into past life readings I think 
I love this. Um, Eight of Wings, Negotiate Your Rebirth. That stands out to me every time I see it. So there's a lot of really good potent cards in here. This is a deck that I feel like I'm not going to feel called to reach for a lot, but I think that when I feel called to reach for it, it's going to do a really good job. This would be a really great deck. It would be a really good deck for doing dream interpretation for yourself, um, untangling something that's particularly hard to grab hold of and kind of seeing what meaning you can pull from it. I think this deck would also do a really good job of sort of having a conversation with your own subconscious in a way because it definitely feels like it's speaking the language of your, of your subconscious, which can be really interesting when you're in the headspace for it. If you're not in the headspace for it, it can be a little bit disorienting. Um, but I really did enjoy my time with it. It's one of those things where it's, it's so unique and I'm so grateful to have it because I feel like when I need something like this, there's not gonna be a whole lot in my collection I can reach for. I would say prior to this, the deck that I would be quickest to reach for for dream interpretation, was there even one? I don't know, but I think I would use this one. I think I would try this one with dream interpretation spreads, and then if it still left me feeling like there wasn't enough concrete information or concrete answers, then I'd reach for something a little more grounded. But this might be a nice in-between to sort of tease out what the dream was trying to tell you. So possibly, possibly. So I don't know, I'm gonna have to work with this some more. This is definitely one that I'm glad to have, but it's very unique, <laughs> so I'll throw that out there. The Illuminated Earth Oracle, on the other hand, is a longtime favorite and is a very solid performer and it played very well with the Flarkos, Flarkos Tarot and in a way, this is, was exactly what I needed to sort of ground the messages of the Flarkos. I feel like these messages are very rooted in um, physicality and in, um, in understanding. These feel like they speak more directly um, and I feel like they helped to untangle the messages in the Philarcos without um, without over being overbearing. You know what I mean? Like some Oracle decks I feel like could over, it would be too much. Like, I don't know what the word is I'm looking for. It would be too much. It would be like it was, um, it was like talking over the Philarcos. And this deck played well with the Philarcos and kind of helped to tease out the messages and provide me some context for some of the things that came through with the, with the tarot. This gave me some a bit of a container for those messages and a bit of a way to interpret them and I really really liked how these these two decks played together. I would definitely pair them again in the future. In fact I'm hard pressed to think of another deck that would pair better with that one because these are so um, earthy and, and rooted. Uh, on the other hand this deck thinking of it too would be really good paired with like if you were going to do a multi-deck reading where you were going to use several decks having this be one of several could be really cool for um, adding nif different perspectives to your readings. Shayla's having a little scratch. <laughs> She's like, what is the jinkling? It's my dog. Anyway, I really enjoyed this one. Um, I always love this one. I will have links to both of these decks down below for you if I remember, I will hopefully remember. I'm trying to get better about that. Um, but yeah, highly recommend this one for sure. This is a solid, solid Oracle deck and it's got a ton of cards, 63 cards. So if you're looking for a good, um, balanced oracle deck where you have messages for sort of an entire um, sort of realm or depth of subjects. This is a really really good one so if you're looking for a good balanced independent oracle with lots of great keywords this is a great one to work with and this is just I think if you're curious this is worth exploring for sure. So those are the two decks I've worked with over the past week. Coming up I'm really excited about what I'm going to be diving into. So I at the end, this is a spoiler alert, if you have not seen yet my Say Yes to the Deck episode number two, you may want to skip the spoiler, but at the end of that episode, I picked up the Tarot of the She. That was ultimately what I ended up deciding on, which was actually not a contender in the episode, so that was really interesting. Um, the Tarot of the She was actually a contender in my Say Yes to the Deck episode number one, and I ended up picking a different deck, but this stayed very firmly on my wish list. This is a deck by Emily Carding. I am hoping to modify this deck this weekend. Um, we'll see if I get around to that or not. But I think what I want to do, and what I've seen other people do and really enjoyed, is take the sides of the deck off, um, but leave the tops and the bottoms. So I'm actually really stoked to get into this deck. I feel like we're gonna get along very well. I've just been really drawn to it. Um, this is what the backings look like, if you haven't seen them before. Um, and this is what they look like bordered. Enjoy that, because I don't think those borders are staying, at least not on the sides. Um, 
I think it's going to look really cool with just the sides uh, removed. So I'm really looking forward to doing that. And I feel like the text is um, small enough and in the center enough that it's not going to get, it's not going to come too close to the border. So I think I'm going to have an easy time doing that. I'm really looking forward to diving into this deck. Like really, really, really looking forward to it. And I have um, done... A, I'm just thinking, have I done a? Yes, I have done a full walkthrough of this deck on my channel. I will link that up in the cards, and I will also have a link to this deck down below because I believe this is still available mass market. Pretty easy to get a hold of, which is great. This is published by... Who is it published by? Schiffer. Schiffer Red Feather. I feel like I knew that and forgot. Um, I've got a little sticky note here because I actually have read a good portion of the guidebook already because I was so excited to dive in when this deck arrived. So that's my little, um, I use post-it notes as bookmarks a lot so that's just in there so that I can easily keep my place when I'm working with this deck. Um, but I'm really excited to play with this this week. Like really, really excited. And part of me was like, I should wait a little longer. I should wait until like midsummer to work with the Fey energies. And then I'm like, no, I want to work with it now. So I'm going to work with it now. Um, and when I tell you what Oracle deck I'm going to use with it, you'll understand, hopefully, well, I'll explain why. I may end up working with this deck over the next couple of weeks as opposed to just the next week. So um, let me explain. So the Oracle deck that I'm going to be working with alongside it, I have not felt called to work with in a very, very long time, but it feels right with this deck. And that is my Brian Froud Fairies Oracle. Now, I've had this deck since the 90s. Um, when, when, I don't even know when this deck came out because I definitely got it when it was newish. Um, oh, I lie, 2000. So um, around that time, so 2000, 2001 is probably when I got this because I did get, when I got it again, it was, it was new. Um, I have edged my copy in a matching color to the sides there, to the borders. Um, I'm actually, if you haven't seen this deck, it's a very wild Fey deck. And my biggest complaint with this is that it feels very, it does tend to feel a little bit dominant in readings when I use it. It tends to just kind of be a little on that overbearing side, like I was just saying. Why are we, we have reversals. Why? Why? Why are you upside down? Why did that happen? Anyway, I'll have to sort these out. Uh, for that reason, because I don't do... Oh, maybe I do do reversals with this deck. Let me just double check the book. Ah, yes. So there is a starter reading and a reverse meaning in the guidebook. The guidebook, by the way, is a really nice hardbound um, book. Um, and there are reverse meanings. So I think I was working with this deck with reversals so that I could work with the blockages and the reversals that are noted in the book. So I am going to keep the reversals in there. Um, some decks I feel like I just need to, to work with those reversals and um, most of the time I keep the cards upright and shuffle them and only look at reversals in blockage positions but I'm probably going to be only working with these one card at a time that's typically how I work with this Oracle deck so I want the opportunity for that shadow to come through if that's what I need to be exposed to in that reading so this is one of those where I feel like you, like I need that element for the deck to give it be able to speak clearly to me if that makes any sense um so i'm going to be working with this so the reason that i might be working with tarot of the she two weeks in a row is if these two play nicely together which i think they're going to um then i'm going to want to work with this another week and switch out to the heart of fairy oracle which is the out of print sequel essentially to this deck that brian froud did with his wife wendy froud so this first one was brian froud and jessica Macbeth who did, who wrote the guidebook, I believe, um, or did most of it. But the second deck, the Heart of Fairy Oracle, is, um, it's actually my favorite of the two, or has been in the past my favorite of the two. Uh, and that was written with Wendy Froud, and also has a hardbound guidebook. So yeah, we'll see. My biggest complaint with this deck in the past has been the frickin' font. I have such a hard time. That one's not so bad, The Dark Lady. Um, but because a lot of the names are, like, not familiar they're not familiar words right so like this is the fairy who was kissed by the pixies and I really had to struggle to read that Now, thankfully these cards are also numbered so looking them up in the guidebook is not really that big of a deal you can just look by the number but for some reason that whole font issue just always like kind of bothered me but I do adore Brian Froud's artwork and when I think of fairies and when I think of the wildness of them this there's no deck like this that captures it quite like this. Um, and the Tarot of the She is actually the first tarot deck I've ever seen that seems to capture that sort of wildness of the Fae. So I think it's going to be a really nice pairing. 
we'll see we'll see if they get along I feel like it's gonna be either really good or it's gonna really clash and I'm not gonna know until I do it um, but for this week I've also decided to pull out a reading cloth that I think the Faye might enjoy using me me using um, it's this side on or it's this pattern on this side and it's this really gorgeous autumn leaves on the other I have used this cloth fairly recently but when I was looking through my reading cloth collection and trying to pick something that I thought that would go really well with these decks this is the one that definitely jumped out at me so that's what I'm gonna do for that and the only other thing I wanted to touch base on really quickly is, because I don't think I've done it yet, is the uh, Lenormand deck and the runes that I'm working with throughout April, because I don't think I actually talked about it yet. Um, so for April, I have been working with the 1889 Lenormand. Uh, this is such a beautiful deck, and probably at this point, um, outside of, say, my Lenormand tiles, because they're just so dang unique. Um, this is probably my favorite Lenormand. Um, it's really stunningly beautiful. It's got this really like antiqued old world feel to it. Um, it's just really charming and the aesthetics of it are really, really nice. It's got the like antique gold gilding that doesn't, it's not overly shiny, but it's like a matte gold gilding on it. And the backings are so pretty. So yeah, I love, love, love this deck. So I use Lenormand right now to do a week ahead reading for myself. Um, and I use them along with a three rune um, pull. And I have now three sets of runes. I have my black onyx runes. I have these ones. These are my favorite by far. Of all my runes, I just, I'm so in love with them because they're just, they're big and they're beautiful. And I just, I know I'm not holding them right, but that's okay, you get the idea. Um, I just absolutely adore these runes. These are my favorites. Um, but I also have, so I have these runes. My, these are my full pine set. I have my black onyx crystal runes, and then I also now have a set of little teeny tiny mini baby runes made out of coffee wood that were made for me by uh, Science to Soul Jen, who is also in this tarot community. So yeah, that was really awesome. And these are what I'm working with this month, though, to do my, my rune and week ahead spread, so I wanted to share that with you. I'm going to, for this week, put away my little tarot wrap because with the hardbound book and so I've got this to carry around. I could actually still, well, let's just see. Let's just see if everything fits in here. So I've got the hardbound book from the Fairy Oracle. It fits. If it fits, it sits. Isn't that what they say? Um, and then my Oracle deck. I think where we're going to run into trouble is with the Tarot of the She. Yeah, we're a little tight fit. Ah, it goes in there. It's just snug. And my reading cloth. I think it's a stretch, to be honest. <laughs> I made a fabric joke. Um, it goes in there. I mean, if I was really determined, I would do this um, because everything does fit. Like I've got my reading cloth, my deck, my book is in this bottom pocket and the whole thing would wrap and then still um, elastic around. But I don't really feel like I need to do that this week. It's a little bit more um, convenient to do it when I don't have quite so much stuff to carry all at once. Um, I like it does hold like a deck and a book beautifully but I want two decks a pretty thick this is a thick book um and my reading cloth but yeah I'm, I'm kind of excited to play with this and this is the first time in a long time I've been genuinely like excited and looking forward to I just found like a little squirrel moment I just had like a little piece of paper from the cover kind of sticking up like a little chip or whatever in the in the laminate but yeah this is the first time in a long time I've really been excited to pull this deck out so I'm very excited to play with it and see what comes through this week and see sort of why this is what felt right to work with this week sometimes I find out as I'm working with them so yeah I meant to make this a shorter video so I could get back to Phantom of the Opera and then I ended up babbling so there you go thank you so much for hanging out with me for my weekly deck review I will see you guys in the next video bye